different, unfortunately, so I have to keep crossing back and forth. But yeah, that's me. Um, I, I'm an assistant professor at, in the School of Journalism at WVU, who is, but I'm actually from Western Pennsylvania, so no loyalty. Um, <laughs> Where? What, where? Uh, up near Erie. I, I'm from Cory, Pennsylvania, originally. Oh, Mercer, so you got hey, Mercer. look at that. Yeah, right. Small world, small world. Um, no, um, Carla Swank, who was at this last year, actually went to high school with her. So, you know. Oh, yeah, small world. It's very cool. <laughs> but yeah, when it works, I got off the elevator and I hadn't seen her in years. And I'm like, oh, hey. <laughs> but, um, anyways, here's the title. Feel free to read it. Uh, but what I'm going to be talking about is, well, a year ago, no more than a year ago, year <coughs> about two years ago, uh, teaching at WVU, I we have an annual session called J Week, and um, I brought in just because I read it, not because I had any connection to this area. Uh, AJ Delaria, who's the the head of the editor of Deadspin.com, if you ever read that, um, one of the, as they call it, some of the Gawker umbrella of blogs is one of the the most read independent sports blog in America which is a lot of qualifiers, but anyways, brought him in, and he had a great talk, talked to us about blogging and running a blog and complaints and running journalism out of the blog, and that was, you know, I got in touch with him because I read it, and I had suggested, oh, you'd be a neat get, so we got it. Um, after that, the dean came to me and said, boy, you know, that was really, he was a really great speaker. Since you're into this kind of thing, why don't you set up a blog journalism class for us next spring? Um, full disclosure, I'm not into that kind of thing. Um, I teach visual journalism. And again, suggested him because I thought it'd be interesting. So this is not my thing. I had no Twitter account. I had a Facebook account. I had no blog. Um, yeah. So I had a year, not quite a year, to learn how to do this kind of thing. And there were a lot of, oh my god, what do I do kind of moments. And in the process of developing, we had this class last spring. And we're going to be having it again this spring. It went over very well. And because of that, though, I thought, you know, perhaps I'm not the only person in the world who feels thusly ill-equipped. <coughs> And perhaps it might be helpful to present this kind of discussion to others. Now, again, full disclosure, I did not present myself as any kind of expert. I present myself as somebody who has gone through this, who has had some things that work and some things that don't work, and can hopefully pass on something to you all. And I feel free to chime in with your own experiences, because I am still learning. And I presume all of you are, too, because that's kind of how this thing works. But anyways, that's where this comes from. So take what you will with a grain of salt, but I'm going to show you some of what I do and not just link to use this, use this, use this, but rather what's behind how we go about teaching. Um, again, I'm a journalism professor. However, if you teach or if you are in journalism in any capacity, having to deal with new people coming in and trying to figure out how to harness some of this stuff, I'd like to think there's something here for you. So do with that information what you will. But the first rule that I had to learn is Douglas Adams's tried and true don't panic going into it, which is exactly what I did. Um, what do I do? You know, left the meeting with the dean with a big smile on my face, went upstairs to Facebook, and immediately sat down and wrote, the dean just asked me to develop a class on blog journalism, what do I do? Which is a great thing to do, and I do not do this with any idea, I'm um, thinking any kind of media savvy, any kind of, you know, I bet you there's a meta lesson here. Um, I did it because that's what I did. When approached with, approached with something that made me panic, I went and panicked to the couple hundred people that followed me. And people answered. People gave me answers when I said, what do I do here? And people said, you should do this. Why not look at this book? Why not try this kind of activity? And I got this great, great, great raft of feedback simply by saying, what do I do? Simply by, shockingly, asking a question. Um, and reasons not to panic. And as I start, Yes, go ahead. Steelers just scored a touchdown. Hey! <laughs> 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 sorry, I it's sorry. Like, it's it's a word. We're in the city. He's gonna tell us to put our cell phones away. <laughs> um, <laughs> he's playing World of Warcraft. That'd be a futile argument. But a couple <laughs> pictures of why you ought not panic. First reasons why you might panic, and then reasons why you really shouldn't panic. Um, chart fields. Feel free to peruse as you will. This is from FlowingData.com, who just put a wonderful data visualization site. But ideas about what people are doing with social media. Um, and again, get the gist of it. Don't look at the individual data points necessarily. But um, what people are doing with social media. Creators, who's, where are the creators? Where do we find them? 1217 and the 1821 group is the biggest crest in the wave. For critics, people who comment on blogs and post ratings and reviews, that crest comes a little bit later. Collectors, people who use RSS and tag web pages to gather information, you get kind of a more of a wavy thing across all the age groups. Uh, joiners, people who use social networking sites, they get a bigger bump. Uh, one that comes a little bit later than the original creators, but you know, a lot of these bumps tend to come around here. And then of course we have the inactives, 
poor uncles <coughs> who don't yet participate in any form of social media, <laughs> down here. Which may or may not be you. Um, but this ain't me. Um, and so seeing this kind of thing, this is the picture we tend to hold in our heads about who's using this stuff. I think, well, clearly it's people who are years and years younger than I am, um, for me and for anybody in this room. And so how do I even begin teaching this kind of thing? At the same time, as a counterpoint, consider this that just uh, came up pretty recently on Read Write, Read Write Web, and there's other studies like it, that the so-called digital natives that we are taught to fear and fear that we are not able to teach more importantly are not necessarily media savvy. They're swimming in this stuff, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they're on board with how to use it for practical ends. Uh, those of you who teach at universities, perhaps even high schools, perhaps even just who work in journalism, have probably gotten that speech. When I started teaching at WVU, they gave us the orientation, and they gave us the big talk about the millennials, the frightening, terrifying millennials who know all things and are always going to be smarter than you and more savvy than you. And they didn't do a very good job of explaining how we ought to teach this group beyond describing those high-powered cyborgs apparently set here from beyond that we can never hope to match in intellect, which isn't the best way to assuage people's anxieties about teaching this group. And so a lot of professors, professors that I know, and professors at our universities tend to throw up their hands and say, well, I guess we just let them do their thing because I'm clearly never going to be able to match them in what they know about Facebook, Twitter, the internet, that kind of thing. Which, again, is probably not the most productive approach. So I wish the university didn't start things like that on that kind of footing. When in reality, we've got studies like this coming out now, which says that yes, they use this kind of stuff, but it doesn't necessarily mean they know how to use it to do something practical, to do a job. Um, this is to demean that generation. It's to say that's true of a lot of us, that just being surrounded with something doesn't necessarily mean you're an expert in it. A fish is surrounded by water can't necessarily tell you the chemical composition of it. So how not to panic? Again, first off, don't fear, and I'm talking about the millennials, but because again, I'm speaking from a teaching angle here. But don't <coughs> fear the people you teach or the people that are coming into your workplace. Uh, yes, they're surrounded with it. Yes, they're savvy with it in a sense, but it doesn't necessarily equal skill. And skills are what you teach as experienced professionals, as educators, that kind of thing. Pay attention to the skills that you hold. And think about these things not as new things. Yes, they are new media. But think about it as just another way to apply good skills of good journalism, good communication, good education. And think about, rather than fearing new technology, how can I do this? And also know what you're dealing with. They're talking about new media. Talking, uh, we shouldn't even really call it that more. It's not really that new these days. But know what you're dealing with and the kinds of thing you're teaching. Social media in this case. Social media is about networks. It's about networks tying people together, tying ideas together, tying things together. Uh, networks are something that can be mobilized to get information, to do a thing, to perform a function, whether it's to have a flash mob of a thousand people dancing in Times Square, or to find out something that not one of the individual people in the network knows, but that all of them know a bit. We can mobilize networks to do more things. This is old knowledge. The idea behind all this is that you shouldn't be worried about teaching technology. Yes, you have to be familiar with Facebook, Twitter, you know, the various and sundry applications out there, but you're not teaching technology, or at least you're not teaching it primarily, you're teaching how to connect. And connecting, and this is, I'm putting my journalism hat on here, connecting is the beginning of journalism. Connecting is not new. This is old shoe leather journalism. Going out in the street and talking to the people in the bars and on the street corners and in the courthouse and getting to know people and developing a community or identifying communities that are already there. These are not new skills. There's just new ways to use them. And you need to keep that in mind so as not to panic. Because you're there to teach connection. You're there to teach skills. The medium is not so important as why you're using it. Um, this is our blog for the class. We will, it's been inactive for a while because it's a spring class, but feel free to go to it. It is at, I apologize for the blue, uh, interactivejournalismwvu.wordpress.com. Um, I'll put it, I'm putting up a uh, PDF of the PowerPoint slides on my personal blog, so if you'd like to have a copy of that, you can get it through there. Um, talk to me afterwards if you like that kind of information. But this is our blog at that. Um, and this was, uh, we used a WordPress blog just because I like WordPress a tiny, better, a tiny bit better than Blogger, but feel free to use what you'd like to use. Um, I like they were able to show more statistics, and I wanted to be able to talk to my students about uh, who was reading our blog, where it came from, what posts were getting read, that sort of thing. So we used WordPress as kind of the mothership for all the blogs we made, and we made a lot of blogs in the class. 
Okay, you will see. You can see over on the side here where you can't see the holes. Actually, maybe I'll just pull it. That'd probably be a little more helpful. This is our blog. This is the most recent one. For their final project, they had to submit an app. They had to uh, submit a proposal for the uh, Night News Challenge uh, for innovative journalistic projects. And so we put up the group's ratings for everybody's different projects. But over on the side here, we have the individual student personal blogs. We have their group blogs, which I'll talk about in a minute. And we had a brief blog role that I wanted the students following. But we use this as a living syllabus for the class. Because one important thing with this kind of thing is if you're going to teach social media, if you're going to teach new media, if we want to call it that, you need to practice what you preach. You can't just talk about this stuff. You just can't just talk about the theory. You have to show how we're applying it. That it's not some separate thing from the class, that it is the class. So the blog was the syllabus. The blog is where you found the assignments. Up top here you can see. If you click on assignments, you can see what the most recent assignment, if it loads up, what the most recent assignments were. And go down through the list, the read and respond assignments. You can see social media challenges, which we'll talk about in a little bit. And so on and so forth. And again, feel free to go and have a look through if you'd like to go and have a look through. But this is where we put everything from the class. It's all up there, so you can see what we did and what you think you could do better. Feel free and tell me about it, because I need to get better as well. Um, so the class that was conceived from the dean saying, talk to the class, we ended up calling Blogging and Interactive Journalism. I am, it is not my favorite name, but I grudgingly understand why it exists. My proposed title for the class was Connective Journalism, which I think is a great title, because it's what it's about. However, I am not a PR person, and I do defer to the preference for saying a little more explicitly, hey, here's the technology that's in, t in this class. Here's what you'll be learning in terms of technology. My gripe with it is that it kind of undercuts what the class really, I think, is about, which is, yes, we're using these media, but we're using them to do something more fundamental to journalism, more fundamental to communication, and it happens to involve Twitter. Um, however, again, I do understand the marketing side. Uh, Again, fair warning, because you may, you may run into such a thing as well from your own respective administrators, or you may present that yourself if you are administrators, and God bless you. Two kinds of blogs that they had to work on. For week two in the class, each student had to come up with a personal blog. This is a 15-week semester we're dealing with here. They had to come up with a personal blog. Uh, not a lot of restrictions for this, because I want it to be personal, but two things, one of which I didn't do that well this semester and will improve next time, is well, first they had to have two updates a week minimum. Uh, the idea being that a blog is something that needs to be updated, otherwise it's, there's no point in people coming back to it, which is pretty fundamental to the nature of a blog. Um, and I should practice what I preach because my own blog, well, again, full disclosure, <laughs> I've got an eight month old, so things kind of fell off for a little while, but I'm back on track now. So, uh, But a blog needs to be updated, and second, a blog needs to have a clear and specific focus. This is something I need to hold them to more closely in the next semester. I will show an example of how this went well. Um, but for every good example, there was an example of someone who said, my focus is pop culture. That's not a focus. That's a lifestyle. Um, that's, that's a world right there. And it's a lazy answer. And to my own detriment, I did not hold them to it because I was new to this as well. I made plenty of mistakes here. But you want a clear and specific focus, which, is, which some students are going to writhe against because I just want to write about stuff, man. Well, not for this class. For this class, because what we're learning here, this seems like to some, a frivolous assignment, to have a personal blog, what do I write about? Well, you write about anything that deals with your focus. Why is that relevant? The idea behind it is that the skills you're learning here are transferable to whatever else. So write about something that you enjoy. Why not start off writing about something that you enjoy? West Virginia pageant culture, which one student wrote about, which is apparently really, really big, and I did not know, but apparently it's huge. Um, great topic. Great topic that nobody else had written about. <coughs> um, pop culture, not so good. Because what is it? It's out there. And having a more specific focus, you're going to do more good to your students because you give them a way to focus what they're writing about, not just feeling you're sitting down to write a diary every day, which is great for personal blogging work, but we are writing something that we're supposed to be applying to larger skills in journalism and mass communication. So make them focus. Make them be painfully specific in a focus. They will thank you for it later when they learn that the skills they learn about being specific and identifying specific communities can be transferred to more journalistic, more real-world pursuits, if you like. Those terms. Second kind of blogging they had to do, group blogs. This came halfway through the semester, week eight. Um, it was about a, I started off as 20 student class, I scared off a couple of them, so we wound up being in about four to five student groups. And, you know, oh, it turned out it was writing intensive. We weren't just reading <laughs> a lot of blogs. 
um, <laughs> four to five person groups. And the requirement for that is every member need to have at least one update per week, which is a pretty robust schedule for a They also need to have it scheduled so that everyone's updating on Fridays so that you had a good flow of content coming throughout the course of the week. Um, and the group logs need to have detailed, specific mission statements that entailed journalism in some way, in some way, shape, or form in the area. Um, as we went on, we developed additional assignments such as recurring departments. So not just write about something pertinent to your topic every week, but um, there was one that was writing about food in the Morgantown area. And one of their focuses was, um, there's a surprising amount of hot dogs and chili dogs in West Virginia. I don't know if you're familiar with this, there's a lot. Um, it's a Western Pennsylvania thing too, to be fair. Um, and so every week they did, they call it, it was like hot dog of the week, or I think, no, they had, what was it? It was, it was something alliterative, it was like the Saturday sausage or something like that. <laughs> but they, they reviewed a chili dog place every week, which is a little thing, but it's, it's a recurring department. And I, I have a magazine background, well, a journalism background. I worked in magazines for a number of years. And one of the things, you know, you learn about magazines, writing headlines is something that's transferable to this. And also having those bite-sized recurring department type things that you can come back to and you can look forward to or you know skip if you're not into that kind of thing. But it gives people another reason to keep following along. So again, two kinds of blogging. The idea being that after they'd had these focused personal blogs for a couple of weeks, they'd be a little bit more on board with how to write a more focused, more perhaps journalistically oriented group blog after that. Here's some examples. And again, down here, you can see this on the blog page. We've got just the group blog listings over here at number two. Um, we had Masticate Morgantown, which was all about uh, food in the Morgantown and, and the, the greater Morgantown land area. Um, so, you know, one of the departments was dining out. So every week they had, you know, they did kind of a budget-based column on uh, where you could eat in Morgantown. West Virginia Brewing Company is one of the more recent ones. Uh, Motown Entertainment. This one suffered a bit because it did kind of have that stuff to do in Morgantown aspect, which wasn't as specific as really benefited them. Now, as they went on, they started getting more into the idea of hidden Morgantown things you didn't know about in Morgantown. And that improved the focus of their blog a lot. And it goes to that specificity focus. Um, and again, these are all up. You can see every one of these. And then the one that worked the best from the beginning was Move In Morgantown, which had a distinctive, specific focus on being a student who has to live somewhere in a college town, right there in their slug. How to live in a college town. That's what this page is about. And every update they had was something like this. They had reviews of different apartments. Uh, they talked to landlords when they could get them. They talked to students who lived in these apartments. They talked about new housing developments. They talked about cheap ways to make do as a student living in on and off campus housing. They did dorm reviews. Really, really focused. Lots of good departments. I mean, this, the content, the aim, the mission statement is pretty much professional quality in terms of how they stuck with it and really just worked this specific focus. And I hold this up as, as an example of a way to take specificity and make it into something fruitful. I think for students approaching blogs, when you tell them to be specific, they feel like you're being you're telling them to limit themselves, and it feels frustrating and confusing. When in fact, something like this produced robust, <coughs> interesting, and specific content that got the most hits, got the most readers, and provoked the most discussion. So specificity, believe it or not, on the internet where anything is possible, specificity is your friend in teaching this kind. You don't want to just chuck it out there like the Wild West. So a case study, going back to the personal blogs. I enjoy this one on cat blogging. Um, one of the students, this is from the personal blogs, uh, decided to write about her cat, Kenzie the Fetching Cat, um, who, who fetches. And she's got a video on the site of Kenzie fetching. Um, but her focus for this personal blog was the experience of living with a cat as a student in off-campus housing which is fairly specific. And she wrote every week about these, you know, she gave us cute cat stories and videos, of course, why not? The internet runs on cute cat stories and videos. <laughs> but she gave us these, but she also talked about the experience of it. She gave tips for things she had done, and most importantly, she engaged a community, which I'll talk about in a moment. This is her, she gave some of the details of where she's from, what she does. This is also our student who did her final project on the uh, West Virginia pageant culture. So um, in her future, if not present, crazy cat lady. Um, this is what she went into it with, but, but doing basically, yes, a lifestyle blog, but also a very focused blog, not just diary, which is fine in its place, but not for, you know, when you're trying to teach students how to do this kind of thing for practical purposes. What worked so well is she engaged the community. Not only did she provide good comment, but, and we had a variety of assignments that required this, which I'll talk about in the last part of the presentation, but she engaged the community. She found, and she came into class, and, and it was, <laughs> I felt bad, because I did this too, she would come into class and she would talk about who responded, who wrote on her blog this week, about who she read this week, 
about the interaction she had, and people would just laugh the entire time because it was, you know, cat people writing about cats and writing back and forth to each other about cats. And let's be honest, pretty funny. Um, but, you know, so we chuckle about this, but the fact is, regardless of what she was writing about, this woman was developing an active community of people that were talking about issues that were relevant to them. She had identified, not even developing, that's giving too much, that's, that's missing the point. She had identified an existing community, made contact with them, became part of them, enriched that community through her presence, and revealed that community, and opened that community to others. That's journalism. Take the cat part out of the equation. That's doing journalism, yes? Did, did these, this existing community know that she was required as part of a school assignment to write this book? It was, it's in a lot, of her, a lot of her posts about what she was doing for this. Okay. And yeah, so she said, you know, I'm doing this. And, and some of the assignments we'll talk about in a moment, some of the assignments she had were to make contact so they could learn about this making contact aspect. And yes, we're talking about cats here, people talking about cats, which again, there's no shortage of that on the internet. But what she learned is how to get in touch with the community, activate a community, talk to a community, and potentially mobilize a community for questions, which we'll get to. But just some of the responses, lots of personal anecdotes that she got from people, which is great. I mean, how often do you get personal responses to your stories? Um, ads, she's the only blog we have that wound up with a, that wound up with the relevant Google ads on the page. So, <laughs> that one kills me. <laughs> um, and clarifications. You know you've made it on the internet when somebody sees fit to correct you. Mm -hmm. um, this, is, uh, this is her blog role. So she listed, no, please note the title, fellow cat blogs, nothing odd about that you would think. I am not into the cat blogging culture. But got a response to that, to her blog rolling. Hi there, sorry I couldn't find your email. I wanted to clarify the blog description for I have cats on your blog roll. I have cat is about my life as a single 30 something, 30 something year old NYC with cats. So it's not really a cat blog in that it's not from the cat's perspective. <laughs> <laughs> I did not know that was a distinction. <laughs> a cat blog is evidently a thing. <laughs> <laughs> and she's using the thing wrongly. And she learned that. And again, we're laughing. But she learned how the community works by doing it and, in this case, doing it wrong and being corrected and learning from her community. I mean, communities have rules. Learning how those communities work, getting in touch with those community members. This is journalism. This is communication. This is something bigger. And yes, she's writing about cats. And every time we talk about it throughout the semester, we laughed about it. And yet, she was getting more comments, more feedback, more response, more activity than anybody else in that class because she really engaged the community. She became part of it. Didn't just send them comments in the hope they would send her comments. She became part of that community, which she would kind of <laughs> blush when she would admit sometimes. But, well, I'm part of the cat people community. Yeah. <laughs> but it's a skill. And that skill is transferable to other perhaps more serious areas, learning how to engage, learning how to connect. That's what class is about. That's why I wanted to, that's why I like that connected journalism idea. Because what we're doing is not about Twitter and blogs and things like that. It's about what we do with them. So the social media challenge, which is the uh, really dynamic name I came up with for uh, some of the exercises we did for learning how to do this kind of thing. And again, there's some things that work pretty well. There's some things that didn't work pretty well. I maybe have a little bit of a fast and loose definition of social media in some, some areas, but the idea was to every one of these ought to have the idea behind them of connecting. Either connecting the students with each other, connecting the students with the community, or connecting ideas to other ideas. So I want to give you just a couple examples of these. This is what I guess would say that this is the concrete portion of the, of the presentation. I've got lots more of them if you're interested, but I tried to come up with a variety of them for different applications and different skills. The idea behind these social media challenges was to use familiar, familiar media to do a job. Use familiar media, media that you might have only used for entertainment, like Facebook, something like that, to do your job, your perspective job. These are all journalism students, well, some in advertising and PR, but all from that mass communication school. And so, you know, just so I can look good in corporate here, I, I pulled out the, the, the keywords, but the idea, the idea is behind these assignments so that they learn how to follow the relevant resources, that they learn how to forge connections between ideas and between people. Um, that they learn how to mobilize those connections. I love that word mobilize, and we'll get into it and you'll get sick of it a little bit later. And, and then synthesizing new ideas via those connections they've made. But in each case, it's about doing something with connections, making them, putting them together, and making something new out of them. Not about learning how to use Twitter, about learning how to use Twitter to do something. So some examples, I, I just put up the three that are 
I think the best examples of what we did. We did other ones as well. But um, the Facebook question. I did this, put this up last night just to see what would happen. I just wrote help, which is no kind of question at all. And within five minutes, got a response. With what? Um, this is similar to what I did with that when I was first asked to start the class. I said, well, how do I do this class? And got 35 responses in the span of a couple hours. Um, ask a question. We don't ever think to do that. We think to tell people what we're doing. We think to talk. And maybe, not, maybe it's not correct to use we when referring to this room. But generally, our students will use Facebook to talk, but not to listen. Um, and not just our students. Generally, most of us use Facebook to talk, but not to listen, or to show off their likes. That's a, one of those awful trends that's picked up lately. Um, things like that. Um, but not to ask, not to hear from this community. When you've got hundreds of followers, probably, people that are capable of being mobilized to help with something. And you can be completely transparent about it. It's not like you're tricking them to do this. You can say, I'm, write, you know I'm writing this for a class. I'm writing a news story that deals with this. Um, I was when talking earlier. I mentioned probably the best people. Who in here follows an NPR or is friends with NPR on either Twitter or Facebook? Um, they're probably, in my opinion, they're one of the best at doing this kind of thing because they just come right out and say it, which seems to be so difficult for many of us to do. Is They come out and say, we're looking to do a story on you know middle-aged warlocks. If you are one or no one, please get in touch with us. And people do. Because people want to answer questions. Um, just asking a simple question on Facebook. So what we have them do, well, you know, think about all the friends and followers we have and how we tend to think in terms of those numbers, how many followers you have, how many friends you have, how many tweets you've made. And yet we tend to treat it as just a passive collection. And again, we is perhaps not correct in reference to this rule, but it tends to be treated as a passive collection. Oh, I've got 700 or whatever. Um, and yet we don't really do anything, consciously do anything. And yet there's so much that can be done with that group, this interaction, this network that we have. And so the challenge in this particular, this is one of the first ones, and I present this not because it's particularly involved, but because it really, um, in its simplicity, defines most of the other social media challenges we did, which was to mobilize this network by asking for help. Just ask a question. That was the nuts and bolts of the assignment. Uh, we wanted a little bit more specifics. We then had students discuss, when did you ask the question? What kind of question did you ask? Did you get different responses to different kinds of questions? Did you get different responses at different times of day? And to think about that interaction, you know, and people found things like, oh, people tend to check the most often right after lunch um, in my class. That's not a statistic I'm going to generalize to a whole population. But, you know, people came and talked about that, who responded to what when. Pop culture questions got the most responses because, you know, the internet. Um, as a new parent, I've found this from personal experience. Uh, parent Facebook users are like a whole cadre out there, if anybody has done with it. You know, I mean, how many people do you know that have a picture of their kid posted as their avatar right now? Yeah. Um, my wife does it constantly. I've refused to just because it's some meaningless milestone that I have to rail against. But, um, but I ask tons of questions on Facebook about things, you know, oh, she's not sleeping. What should I do with this? How do I eat? And you get answers immediately. Parents love to talk about parenting, but it's not unique to that group. Um, so that skill behind asking a question is something that we often don't think to do, or if we do think to do it as parents, we don't necessarily apply it to our professional life. And yet this is a pool of people that knows things and that knows other people, that can answer a question, that can help. Uh, blog synthesis, that sounds far too critical. Uh, we, all, we all have, anybody who has a blog has a blog role. Uh, but think about what you do with your blog role. Do you use it, and I ask the students this, a lot of my students would put up a blog role as a list of things that are good. And almost as trophies, like, yes, I read these things. I read this blog and this blog and this blog. And aren't I wonderful? Um, but why not use it as a tool? And a lot of people do. Again, this room, you're, you're weird. You don't count. Um, but think about, <laughs> think about your students. And if you're, I require them to have a blog role. And then think about why we have that. What are you doing with that blog role? Are you reading it? If you're reading it, great, you're being informed. But what are you doing with that? And so we have a social media challenge in that area. We requ I require them to follow um, relevant blogs to their state admission statement uh, through RSS. They're using Google Reader right now. Uh, they have to forge connections by commenting on those blogs. So go to the blog and say things, and not just good post, but you know, develop. Yes, yeah, that's the hardest thing to learn, right? And you're like, I like your ideas. You sound like a spammer. Um, but comment, developing relationships, and then. One of the additional assignments we had was to synthesize new posts. And you have to give them a number. It's artificial to do so, but you've got to give them a number to start off with. I would say you have to identify three posts by three different blogs that you are following and synthesize a post from them. Not just saying what they said, but taking those three ideas said in those posts, 
because those blogs ought to be related since you have a focus. Taking ideas from three different blog posts and citing them and come up with something new based on that. Keeping in mind to always link and give credit because otherwise you'll get people to say, here's a great idea that I have that gives no credit to the three blogs where the origins came from. So you need to teach this kind of stuff. Going back a step to that forge connections by commenting. I had, it sounds kind of boneheaded, but I had the great, a great aha moment from a student on that thing because we've been doing this, you know, you have to comment on others' blogs and you have to keep doing it for a couple weeks. And he came up and said, so wait, I wrote on this guy's blog about, because I really like this post he did about a movie, and he came and wrote on my blog. So do I need to write back to him? I said, well, if you have something more to say to him, yeah. He says, okay, well, yeah, I do. I wanted to say something. I just wanted to be sure I was allowed to. And I said, no, no, no. I, I said, you want to you keep talking. I mean, the idea behind doing this is, yes, I'm requiring you to comment on 10 blogs, I think was the number I gave him. But <coughs> the reason we're doing this is so you're becoming part of that community, not to trick people into coming to your blog. And he kind of stood there for a moment. So you mean we should be writing on people's other blogs because we're interested in what they have to say? <laughs> and this sounds like a joke, and I mean, we laugh, but it's something that you do have to teach. Because we tend to think of blogs, I and mean, we've all heard the, the, the crack about, uh, about Twitter being like, well, I don't, I don't go on Twitter because it's just people talking about what they ate for breakfast. You know, and it's cliche at this point. Um, and there's people that are out there, but you, know, you don't have to follow them. Um, and the same kind of thing. They, a, lot of the stu a lot of my students have this picture of blogs as these things that talk and just talk out into the void, much like I'm doing now. Um, and they just talk and talk and talk and talk and talk. And they're out there, and you can go listen to them you want, and you can leave. Rather than thinking of them as a connective point in a network, as a place that, yes, talks, but done correctly, also listens, also integrates, also connects members of the community. And that aha moment, and I don't say that to make fun of the student because I was thrilled that he had it, that, wait, we're doing this because we want to hear what they have to say and we want them to hear what we have to say? Yes. That's why we're doing it. Not to trick people into coming to your site and then never commenting again. Sometimes you're trying to trick them. Yeah, sometimes. We are sure why not. I mean, you got to get, get the ball rolling somehow, right? But ideally, you're doing this because you're having a conversation. And I don't mean to use that in the cliched, non-descriptive, join the conversation view, but rather you're literally having a conversation. It's just different than the face-to-face -face that you have now. But you're teaching students how to talk and how to listen. And perhaps that how to listen part is the more important part because we all know how to talk today because it's all we do. Um, but teaching how to listen, how to listen, how to use, how to integrate, how to ask questions, that's a real skill that you can give people in their social media use. And so the third one, I just, I like this one. It's a little bit, it's a little bit uh, distant from social media perhaps, but I think the idea behind it is what makes it relevant. We use Google Maps. Um, thinking about when we use maps, every student in my class has used MapQuest, has used Google Maps to figure out how to get to the theater, how to get to the art museum, how to get to whatever. But my favorite thing about Google Maps is right there. If you've ever used Google Maps, you might have never seen this before. It's just a nondescript little blue link right under the main page, but collaborate. If you click on that, you can access, you can invite as many people as you want to work, to work on a map uh, by adding their email address into it. People can come, they can join, and they can create a collaborative map. What we did, and the students loved this because they thought they were getting away with something, even though it took the same amount of time, is we didn't have class in the classroom. I told everybody, stay home and get on a computer. So we had the first half hour of class in a chat room uh, via eCampus, which is like a Blackboard site that we do has for us. And we talked about you know, maps and, and communal work and that kind of thing. And then what we did, because we kept the chat window open, and we went to Google Maps. Everyone had gotten an invite. And we went and we mapped uh, retirement home statuses in West Virginia, all available to the federal government, that lists their ratings. Uh, there's three different ratings, and there's also a composite rating and it lists whether they're publicly or privately owned. Um, I've done this in other classes. We've mapped uh, health violations, which is a scary thing to do because you see a certain section of the town that you just never want to eat in. Um, sex offenders, which is also horrifying because there's a lot of those guys that are either like next to schools or that apparently live in a park or they're giving P.O. boxes for their addresses that nobody has questioned this. So, you know, don't do this with a grain of salt. Visualization can scare the hell out of you sometimes. But, um, <laughs> but we did the whole project remotely. So the way the project was done as well as what the project was, was the social media aspect. And we created this. Um, this is the nursing home map. And this is the description over from the side. Um, a couple of got, green got the most, green was five stars, red was one star, you can figure out the rest. If it had a dot, it was for profit. If there was no dot, it was non-profit. And this shows based on uh, Medicare.gov, this is all 2010 data on 
statuses of every nursing home in West Virginia. You can see, and a good, gra I, I'm an information graphics nerd, it's my background, and the great thing about this too is it's not the end of the story. A good information graphic leads to more questions, which leads to more stories. Why are there so many red graphic, red nursing homes down here? Why do you not want to send your grandmother down here? Um, why is this area better? Why are there more publicly or more for-profit ones here than in this section? And you know, any, any number of other questions. There's no homes here because this is a big forest. But if you're wondering, I also think it's cool how you can basically see the shape of West Virginia through the dots. <laughs> Um, little panelism for you. But the project was done via social media philosophy. We weren't meeting in person, we were all at our individual computers, and we did this in the span of about an hour. Uh, made a map. Every student got their own county. I think I had to double up a couple that were sparsely populated. Um, every student got a county or two and put it together just like that. And it was great seeing in my end watching the dots just go <laughs> popping up all over the map. And created a thing, the 16 of them created a thing that is news in the span of about an hour, having no graphic experience whatsoever. It's connection though, again. So behind all this then, how teaching this stuff, just to take away from all this. Those are some examples. I've got others of things I've done that I don't want to drone on too long. But the idea I'd like you to take away from is that yes, learn the apps. You absolutely need to learn the apps. Learn Google Maps. Learn you know, the ins and outs of Facebook, that kind of thing. But teach the skills behind them. Teach the connective skills behind them. That's what you're here for. That's what your students don't know that you can give them. Not how to use Facebook, how to use Facebook to do a specific thing. Um, use those if you like buzzwords. Uh, use that connectivity to follow, to forge, to synthesize, and to mobilize. Bring those passive audiences into action, to actually do something, not just say, I've got 700 followers. Ask them a question. And teach your students not just to take, not just to stand on their blog soapbox and talk, but to actually participate to become part of the community, and that means hearing as well as speaking. So go out and find your cat people. You know, find the nerds. The nerds are out there, and the nerds are the ones with opinions and communities, and that are interesting to talk about, quite frankly. And you know, once again, don't panic, because you know more than you think you do. You're just teaching them in a different way. That's all the stuff in PowerPoint. Um, who in here is a teacher right now? Or what, what are some of the backgrounds of people that are in here? I mean, hopefully some of what I've said has been relevant to at some point. Are, are we journalists or are we just, I know you're a journalist, right? Mm -hmm. Journalists. Yeah, what questions do you have? When, when, you, when you taught this, did you uh, see any differences or any from people that wrote in the first person opposed to second or third person? Was there any, was any uh, anything that you could uh, Add as far as that goes. Hmm, that's a good question. Well, for the personal blogs, you, you, it was all first person. I think everybody wrote the personal blogs first person. Um, and like I said, part of that was I didn't require as much of a specificity as I ought to have. I think I would have allowed that anyway. Sure. But um, it was definitely more given to like the kind of like diary like approach, which which is fine. It's, it's a personal blog. It should be. Um, for the for the group blogs, not so much. What I saw the most of it for was reviews. And you know, going way back in history, when I was in college, I was a movie reviewer, and the hardest thing I had to learn was getting the eye out of my reviews as well, and like trying to stop being funny and and you know saying I did this and I enjoyed popping. You don't care that you want to find out about the movie, and so that was one of the things that I and I would I would like to work on that more because reviews are a critical part of that group blog process, I think. But teaching how to do good reviews, I think I would actually need to include a stronger component on that, or uh, rather than. You know, that it is a different animal than just writing about, I think this, even though it is, I think this, to an extent. Um, yeah. So, other questions? Yeah. How did you, uh, what were the steps you used to teach someone who has no experience in blogging mm -hmm. to go through those first very difficult initial steps mm -hmm. of being a blogger? Well, that was pretty much all of them. Um, and what we did, every class, it was, a, it was one day a week class, so, you know, not quite three hours. And so the second half of every class, we'd go down into the computer lab, and we'd just work. We'd take the half the class as a group. So we got up WordPress. We had, um, and again, I stole from PodCamp um, and how I was taught to use it last year, which was we got a hapless volunteer to come up in front of everybody and create a blog, and because that was me last year. <laughs> and, and just come up in front of everybody. We had the screen up just like this, so she's working, so everybody could see what she was doing, and came up with the blog, so she came up with the title on the spot. She did a first post like that, and they were following along. 
and we learn by doing. And then, you know, that didn't take the whole half the class. So after that, we just let them work on say something and say, by the end of this class, you need to have your basically your hello world post up. And I hovered around, asked questions. The, the one thing, and this is true of any class I teach or any lab class I teach, is you find the students that do get it right away and you conscript them. <laughs> so, okay, great. Jerry knows how to do this. Great. Jerry, you got this done. Show Matilda how to take care of this. I'm going to go talk to Barbara over here. And, you know, it's like the board. You just keep spreading the, the knowledge virus on and on and on. But that's, it worked surprisingly well. We had, I mean, students that didn't do anything like this. And every lab we did, they came out of it knowing how to tweet, knowing how to post a new blog, knowing how to add photo or video to their blogs or that kind of thing. As the semester went on, we would do things where we would identify students that did stuff that was outside the scope of it. And I'd say, hey, come up and show us how to do that thing you did on your blog this week. So the idea was that we tried, I tried to teach organically as well as just what I had on the roster for that day, saying, like, you did something cool. Show us what you did. So is that is your question? Yeah. Yes. Uh, so you're teaching uh, journalism students who are learning a discipline of finding and writing around facts and then connecting into blog spheres that yes. are <coughs> writing around opinions and speculation without the same editors and fact checkers. They could be. I'm sure many of them mean to write about facts when they're available, but mm -hmm. they're not. So some of these worlds, though, are not built on the same discipline of writing. And so maybe your students understand that, but that the people they're connecting with and commenting back and forth with, what were the challenges of, of them explaining to the people mm -hmm. uh, where they're coming from and what responsibilities they have? No, that's a, that's a very good question. And it's complicated by the fact that it was in, it's in the journalism school, but that school comprises uh, print, broadcast, visual journalism people, as well as public relations and advertising people. So you have different. So you really don't even have that base level of experience that <laughs> that you that you propose that you'd like to hope you have. Um, and at its worst, I had we we had a number of come to Jesus moments. Um, I had one student who was with the best of intentions, and in fact, his writing got picked up, he's not getting paid for it, but got picked up by, he wanted to write about uh, European soccer, and that was his thing, for his personal blog. And so he was writing these great soccer updates. <laughs> the thing is, he gave no credit to where his information came from. He was like, oh, so-and-so got picked up by Manchester United this week, and this is happening. And he did about three posts like that, and I read and said, Austin, you're not telling anybody where your information's coming from. You're stealing this and not giving it. So, well, I, you know, and it's sometimes he linked the things. But a lot of times it was just, I, he read this information, so he transmitted about it. And not said, I think it's great that so-and-so is going to Manchester United, even though that would, pro that would require a site as well. And so things like that that I would take for granted, I think, that students, because this is an upper-level class, it's all juniors and seniors, mm -hmm. that I would take for granted that students would understand at that point. Um, and perhaps they would if they were writing for a traditional format. But going to the blog, I mean, you can't take anything for granted. And so what I need to do more of, and hopefully this gets to your question, what I need to do more this semester is address things like that at the beginning as well as catching them after they happen, because they'll still happen, because that's how it works. Um, but about being upfront about where you're coming from. Um, when you comment elsewhere, I wouldn't necessarily say, especially for the personal blogs, that they would have to, every time they posted a comment, say, I'm ready for, another, for this class. Um, Largely because when they post comments, they are adding their URL so somebody can go to their blog and see where they're coming from because they are all saying, I'm posting as part of this class on their about statement. Um, but if they're asking something, if they were asking questions for a specific story, clearly they need to be upfront about that. But I'm writing a story about you know, people who write about uh, cats for my journalism class. Uh, I would like to interview you for it. You know, clearly that needs to be stated up front. So, Hopefully the short answer is what I've learned is I need to be more explicit about that than I expected I would need to be about. You need to be, you need to say who you are when you are working as a journalist. And even when you're not, you need to make it sure, you need to make it clear that people know where you're coming from and your readers know where your facts are coming from. Because I think a lot of that gets taken for granted. Does that go to your question? Sure. Okay. Along that line, what was the practical outcome of this class and, mm -hmm. and your future classes? I mean. Did, did the, the school newspaper pick up and have a blogging series? Are you using, are you teaching journalism students to use this as um, an investigative skill, mm -hmm. um, just to get new and different sources? I mean, what what's the practicality of the class? Sure. Well, one thing, one thing we're talking about. I mean, there is, you know, I've just spent a whole half hour talking about how it's not about the applications, but you know, learning the applications is part of the class. Like learning how to take those and develop sources um, to. Excuse me, 
identify and engage communities that they might write about for the Daily Athenian, uh, for the, the, the in-house broadcast that we do, uh, for that sort of thing. So in the sense of developing connections, of meeting sources, of integrating with communities, it's just another, in that sense, it's another tool for getting in touch with the people that you need to write about or talk about or report about. So at that level, that's definitely an application. In terms of uh, students getting hired and getting jobs elsewhere, uh, this goes back to when we had uh, the editor of Deadspin come and talk to us. And one of the things he said was, oh, it's too bad. You know, I'd love to see more schools with blog classes because that's the kind of clips I'm looking for when I'm hired. Now, granted, that's a blog editor, so of course he's looking for that. But we've had other, uh, we've had other professionals from newspaper, from broadcast, that have said students that can do this and can write journalistically oriented blogs <coughs> definitely stand out to us. Mm -hmm. So there's a student's, you know, demonstrating skills in a way that will get them jobs as well as students supplementing their immediate work aspect of it. Those are, I think, the two main takeaways they have. Two other questions. Yes. The, the first being, is there a policy that, uh, that the West Virginia J School is teaching about how to document and cite internet sources? And there's there's is not right now, and I think there ought to be. Okay, and so there's no protocol being taught for that. No, I mean right now, you know, we we, we have we do readings about that. We discuss anonymous sources. We discuss why we don't really use Wikipedia for a news story. Um, but we do, you know, but we don't. The thing, you know, and that's another thing that that's another a trigger that we're all familiar with. At the same time, we talk about Wikipedia, and we say, you know, Wikipedia is a wonderful place to start a story to uh, to look for sources. Because the best Wikipedia, you know, not to just make it a laughing stock, I think that does a disservice to it. Um, we present it, we say, look, go to this Wikipedia page and find out where they got their information from. And if the information's reliable, that's a source. Mm -hmm. And you might even say, if you really want to be transparent, that we were directed to these sources via Wikipedia. But, you know, the students have spent so long learning um, that Google study I showed you. It says that students are very not savvy when it comes to using Google. The one thing students are critical about is Wikipedia use because they've had it drilled into their head uh, through high school, a pretty good proportion of students know Wikipedia isn't an acceptable, or write that Wikipedia is not an acceptable source. And yet, it is. It just needs to be used in the proper way. Not as God's honest truth, but as a source of sources. If you learn how to read, like a graduate student basically, learn how to read the bibliography and find out where the data came from, it's a wonderfully powerful source. And even in the general, it's a great jumping off point. It just shouldn't be the jumping in point. It shouldn't be the end point of the research. So. That's what we've talked about with regard to sources. And as a journalist myself, mm -hmm. and as somebody who's worked in journalism now, you're in academia, and have become a new blogger, what is the application of blogging and what you're teaching the students and what you would like to see or believe should be out there for the application of this to uh, actual journalism sites? You know, what, what can be done in my paper? I mean, I've seen a lot of other newspapers. My paper does not have any bloggers. Mm -hmm. But in a lot of other papers, you know, blogging came along two or three years ago as a big thing, and suddenly every newspaper had the daily blogger, where I've actually seen sites that have four or five bloggers mm -hmm. each and every day. And is that the application of it, that you just simply, oh, we have a blogger in house? Sure. You know, what, what do you see going on with this? Well, yeah, and, and start to start off with, you know, that's always the worst thing you see is like, oh, we have a blogger, we have a Twitter account, we have a Facebook page, mm -hmm. and it doesn't get updated. There's a, it come out, I think it was last week or a week, a week before that, you know, the, that a local fabric, on The Onion, that a local fabric store started a Twitter account that has two posts in mm -hmm. six months or something like that. I'm mangling it horribly. It's, no, 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 I, really know, I saw that one. So. And, and that's what happens, though. And the reason why it's a funny joke is because that is what happens. Um, it's not just this magical totem that you get that creates journalism. Um, but thinking about, you know, what, you know, making sure that kind of thing is used and what I go back to, it's funny, all my annoyances turn into what I, like, think is potential, has potential at social media right now. Um, I come from a small, you know, I come from Corey, Pennsylvania, which is like 5,000 people. And um, they had a thing called Speak Out in the newspaper where people would call in and gripe about whatever made them mad about the school district. I hated Speak Out, hated it so much. But the idea, because it was a bunch of anonymous people telling lies about what the school board was doing. Um, however, at its heart was a good idea that what if we had a section where people would talk about what was happening in their community without the filter of us? Which is a great thing. You hear what people are talking about. Lots of small town newspapers, weekly newspapers, you'll see those things written by you know, Aunt Mabel who writes about local gossip around town or local happenings around town. And we chuckle about those things. And yet, that's, that's a source of community information. That's something you can provide. That's something you can provide now. Um, what, I forget his name now. Ken, 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 Ken Ward, I think. Yes, Ken Ward from, in Charleston. 
did with the recent mine disaster down there in the spring. Um, he blogged incessantly what was happening with the mine disaster while it was happening. And that's when you want to know what's happening in the mine disaster, especially if you've got families in the mine. Being able to do that kind of thing right now is, that's an immediate application. Yes, there's a fact checking issue. So you want to have a full disclaimer about what's ha what I'm writing here is what I'm writing right now. And it may be modified as more facts come to light. You want to be transparent about where that information comes from. But um, the other great thing about it, and again, this is my West Virginia perspective, but West, Western Pennsylvania has plenty of rural areas as well, is that WordPress, which is not on the screen, oh yeah, it's, yeah, great. WordPress and things like that are accessible to anybody with internet. So you don't need to hire a webmaster for your three reporter newspaper. You get a WordPress account, you get a blogger account for free, and you can supplement the news via that. So it's accessible, um, which is good because it allows small communities to get on that kind of board. Instead of just being like, well, New York Times has 800 bloggers. It's the Pocahontas County newspaper can provide some breaking information for when they need to do that, which isn't going to be that often in Pocahontas County, but in Pocahontas County. But there will be times that we need to provide that. And being able to do that easily is a good thing for journalism and for the readers of the newspaper or the television site or the, the broadcast station or whatever. Thank you. Yeah. Anybody else? Go. Ten three Steelers. <laughs> <laughs> Yeah, to the minute. We're progressing a little faster than last week. Are we all good? All right, well, thanks everyone for coming.